there was a spider on the computer up here, and that kind of that kind of set the class in the chaos uh, uh, for a while. Um, so we'll see if that happens. There's people yelling, "Kill it! Kill it!" It's like I'm not going to kill a spider. And finally, someone ended up taking it outside and, and let it let it run free. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, there seem to be a lot of people that, that hated them. Uh, I, I'm not big on them. I mean, by no means. Not like I'm a spider lover, but you know, uh, I, I, I warned this guy if he got bit, maybe maybe Monday he'd come in and you know have special powers and you know and, and, and do that sort of thing, you know. Right. Oh, I, I the spider. I don't know what what it is, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, bigger I ones. Got bit on the spot on the neck by a spider while we were playing cards. We didn't know it was a spider. We just thought it was yeah. crazy for a little bit. Until the next morning, was sick. Went to the hospital. Looked like he got burned on the neck. Oh really? Yeah, no, it was a spider bite. It's like wow. It didn't drop down on you anywhere. And it's a oh, okay. That's why I don't like spiders. All right, sorry I brought it up. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I'm scarred for life. Yeah. Um, what, uh, my, my poor daughter has gone through a lot. She was actually stung by a jellyfish, um, maybe a year and a half ago, and then she had a spider bite, uh, pretty recently, or, or some kind of bug bite. We assume it was a spider bite, and, and she had kind of a bad reaction to it, but not like the, not like the jellyfish. That was, that was nasty. I wasn't there. That, that's the thing. She was actually with, with one of her friends, and, uh, and, and, ne and neither me or, or, or her mom were with her, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I have a feeling she actually got, got got maybe stung by a couple of them. You know, maybe, you know, maybe like she said she, it felt almost like she brushed up against seaweed, except then it started to hurt, <laughs> you know. So, all right. Uh, at any rate, uh, we'll, we'll try to stay safe this class. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, any bugs that we see in our programs, we will definitely squash them. All right, I don't feel bad about squashing them. So let's pick up where we left off last time. Um, and, and where we were, uh, I, I want to spend just a little bit of time recapping where, where we were. And, and then I want to move forward uh, to sort of summarize. Um, to recap, first of all, to allow the user to maintain, that is, update, uh, insert, and delete, in either the detail view or the grid view is actually pretty easy. Now keep in mind the grid view you can only update and delete. You can't insert in that. And the details view you can do all three in. But to just allow that to happen is actually pretty straightforward to do. Um, because again, both objects, both components have their role. You have to make changes to both sides. You have to, to in the SQL data source, in addition to supplying the select command, you have to supply the insert, update, and delete command as well. And it works very similar to uh, our, our select commands insofar as we have parameters associated with it. Um, and uh, those parameters then get, will, will get filled in by things that were, um, things that were um, in, the, in the grid view or details view. Um, as far as the details view, uh, or grid view goes, as far as the visual component, um, really all we have to do is check a couple of boxes saying we want to allow them to be able to insert, update, and delete. All right, And they're able to do that. Now, before we start getting too happy about this, the downside is, is, is it does it in a very sort of crude, limited, um, it is definitely not a, a, a what I would call like a production level code that it creates for that. We have to go back and make some edits and, and changes to it to get it to behave the way we would want it to. Uh, it's really not up to snuff. It's not up to snuff in a number of, uh, of ways we, we talked about last time. It's not up to snuff because um, the deletion just deletes. There's no confirmation at all. The error messages that it gives are very ugly. 
um, it, it gives the, the .NET frameworks error messages which wouldn't be intimidating or, or scary and meaningless to, to a user. Um, everything that we're going to edit appears in a text box. All right, and there are certain things we, we clearly don't want in a text box. We, we want, uh, you know, uh, some things to be in drop downs uh, and so on. In addition, there's no validation. And therefore, uh, to get any of those things happen, we kind of have to, to extend the default uh, functionality. How do we do that? By and large, we do that through two, two mechanisms. The one mechanism is we add some coding to some events, and we'll look at uh, examples of that. And the other thing that we do is we convert columns to template columns. What template columns allow us to do is sort of customize and say, okay, normally by default it's going to give you a text box for this field. Uh, instead, we want a drop down. Normally, there's no validation in this field, but we want validation in it, and so on. So let's look at what we had last time. And and spend a few minutes seeing if there's any questions, and then we'll move forward. So let me go and I'll set this as a start page. All right, we already did a little bit of the tweaking of this. Uh, I think we added validation to um, the one name field, the last name, as this comes up. But we did not do any validation uh, of any of the other fields. Um, we did not add the confirm to the deletion. I also think we did put some error checking um, to give a nicer error message when we delete. All right, let's take a look at this again. By default, with this one, I enable both edit and delete, so I can click at it. And when we click at it, it goes into a edit mode. And that edit mode is everything that we can change will appear in a text box. All right. So all these things that we can change, whoops, appear in a text box, including some things that probably would be better in a drop down. You know, state would be better in a drop down. Class would be better in a drop down. Faculty ID would definitely be better in a drop down uh, because um, you know it, it's tying to something to to another database table. Now, we did add some kind of validation here. So if we click update, it gives us that error. All right. And in addition, we added on the delete, we added some error checking, all right, where we display a more descriptive error message, um, as opposed to this sort of error message if we entered in an invalid faculty ID. If we don't do anything, we get this sort of message, which really, again, uh, is, is, is useless, is scary, the user has no idea what to do. And in fact, as I, as I mentioned before, we're only getting this descriptive of an error message because we're running on, our client is the same as the server, and so it knows we're in development mode. Uh, actually, by default, uh, .NET suppresses these sorts of error messages for fear of like, giving information to, to people trying to infiltrate the system, like what your table names and column names and, and stuff like that are. All right. The Details view is just about the same as the grid view, except there is an insert in it. But it's pretty awkward the way it's coded now. We have to first go into um, pull up someone and then click new. So that's something we want to change as well. Let's look at the code that does this. <clears throat> Again, in the data source, I go in and I now have, in addition to the select statement, I have an update and delete. 
So if I look at the update, we'll bring that up in Notepad. Notice it has those question marks that are going to get filled in at runtime from values that are in the grid view. All right. There's a where clause attached to it that is pulling and uh, using the, the primary key of it to make sure that we only change that one row. Um, I mentioned before that's why if uh, even if you're not even if you don't want to display the primary key. Um, you want the, the, the primary key in the data source so it can be used, uh, so it's available if you're going to do an update. Now the statement was asked, what if they only change one or two of the fields? What happens? Well, the way this is written, the default behavior, which generally speaking is probably acceptable, is it will still go and update all the fields. It will just update some of the fields to have the exact same value it had before. So if I don't change the state from Ohio, for example, uh, it'll say update student set blah 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 state equals OH. Alright, so um, is that 100% safe? Of course not. Um, we'll talk at some point about the concurrency issue and, and we'll see um, we'll see the implication of, of that because uh, one of the checkboxes we checked is that we wanted optimistic concurrency. All right, uh, or I'm sorry, we did not check that we wanted optimistic concurrency. We don't have any concurrency checking right now, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means uh, in a future class. As far as the grid, and we, we have similarly an insert and delete statement. Um, we also have then on the grid view we went and clicked the enabled editing, enabled deleting and that's the change we had to make. Now for the last name what I did is I went in and I made that last name by editing the columns I made it a template field. So notice that it says it's a template field now, which means we have a greater degree of control about how that works. How do we control how that works? If we click here, we can edit the template fields and we can specify for that last name field an item template, the item template being what it looks like in display mode. We can specify an alternating item template that is maybe for every other row we want to stagger them a little bit so it's easier to read or something like that so we, we can do it alternating lines. Then we have our edit item template and our edit item template what we did is we changed it from a label. I'm, I'm sorry we did not change it from a label. We, it was a text box. We added to it a required field validator so we could validate to make sure that something was entered there. All right. Um, if there was adding possible on this, like there would be on a details view, uh, there would also be an insert item template. All right. So um, kind of wish that the edit and insert item template were one and the same, that there weren't two separate ones. But there isn't. So if you want to make something have a text, uh, a drop down, you have to do it in two places. All right. Again, hey, it does a lot of the work for you, so you can go and do this stuff. The last thing I want to look at to review is we explored some of the events associated with this, and we we specifically looked at the data source having six events, you know, three groups of two that are phrased in terms of the present tense and the, pa and the past tense. For example, there is a deleting event which occurs before the item is deleted and a deleted event that occurs after the item is deleted. Alright. Similarly, that's one of the pairs of, of events. Similarly, there is a item edited or, or, or updated and updating, I'm sorry, and an inserted and inserting. 
So, if we want to put code in after something is deleted, this is our place for it. Okay? And we at least in this case, and probably in most cases, want to put some code to do our air trapping as opposed to letting us get those ugly airs. If you remember, I got the nice air when I deleted. I got the ugly air when I tried a bad update. Why? Because I put this code in the deleted event and not in the updated event. I need to pretty much put the same code in the updated event. What do we do? Well, when these events happen, the inserted, the updated, and the deleted, these events get called and they get passed a variable called E, which is of this type. SQL source, data source status event arguments. And essentially, what that object contains is all the relevant information about what happened. All right? And we're able then to look at that object and decide a couple different things. One of those things being, did it work or not? Did the delete succeed or fail? How do we tell if the, the uh, delete succeeded and failed? If an exception is created, if an exception object is created, then we know that something went wrong. All right? We have this great ungrammatical statement, if not E exception is nothing, then, and in other words what that's saying is, is there something in the exception object? Another way of saying that is, was there an error? So if there was an error, what do we want to do? I want to put up a message that says that there's a problem deleting. I want to give some possible causes of this. And then I, I set the second error text box, or label rather, to the message that's associated with that exception object. And then lastly, we tell the .NET framework that we handled this one by setting that E exception handled equal to true. That says, hey, we got this one. No need to, to worry about it. And you don't have to process it yourself. If we look in that exception, or in that, that E object, there's also an affected rows. All right? What do you think, what do you suppose that translates to? The affected rows. In this case, it translates to how many rows got deleted, right? So, probably be either a one or a zero, right? If it, if, if it was actually deleted, it would be a one. If it wasn't deleted, for whatever reason, maybe because it didn't exist in the first place or whatever reason, it would be a zero. All right. And the command, I believe, is the actual command that got submitted to the database. Um, let's go, just for laughs, and in curiosity on my part, and let's put that command in that text box. Let's put the command text from that command in the text box. Let's see out of curiosity what this thing was going to look like. the actual command that gets submitted to the database. So that might be very insightful if the deletion fails. Especially if the, the deletion fails and you think it's a bug in your code. In other words, the deletion isn't failing because, um, because uh, you know, foreign key constraints. It's failing because, you know, hey, there's something wrong with your, with your code. So if we go and click delete this guy, it shows that the deletion command had happens. Unfortunately, it doesn't fill in those parameters, which I wish it would. But my guess is if we look further in that command, we could probably pull the parameters too if we were interested.
Yeah, there's parameters. So we could look at the parameters that got passed to it. And we don't have to just put it in a text box, right? We could, when we run debug, we could, um, we could uh, use our debugger to, to show those fields. All right. That's sort of what we covered last time in a nutshell, a, a review, and, and maybe hitting some things from a slightly different angle. Are there any questions about that stuff that we did? Because our job over the next class or so, I don't know if we'll wrap it up today or, or wrap it up next time, is to take this code that it created for us that is a good start, but by no means complete, and complete it. You know, make it production worthy. So, one thing I'm going to do real quick here is I'm going to pretty much copy this code and put it in the item updated event. That way, if there is a problem with the update, we get our nice error message as well. I'll put something descriptive that I think users would understand and we'll make sure that that works. So if we go and edit this guy and we go and we change the faculty ID to some bogus number. Again, we get a nicer error message than, than, what, um, than what we had before. All right. Let's go now and make the delete, uh, confirm the deletion. All right. Uh, and there's probably a bunch of ways that we could do this. All right. Um, I am going to do it um, probably the, the quick and dirty way, but you probably could do it other ways as well. All right. Now again, a little, little, little bell should go off in your head. We want to do something different than the default behavior. So what does that imply? That implies we have to convert the column into a template column. Because if it's a template column, then we can actually get in and, and make our changes and customize the way it does it. Otherwise, we're stuck with what it gives us. All right, the template column is what allows us to go in and sort of customize how we want it. By default, it doesn't confirm the delete. We want it to confirm the delete. Therefore, we're going to go in and customize it. So, how do we do that? I'm going to go and pull up the grid view. I'm going to go and edit columns. And I'm going to pick this command field. The command field is what? It's that first field that has all these things in it. it. Has the edit and delete. Actually, it has the edit and delete when the page first loads. If we go into edit mode, it shows you other things, right? It shows you uh, update and cancel, all right? And insert, I think it shows you insert and cancel. But that's the first column of the grid view, this, the, the, this commands, which again, the commands change depending on what mode we're in. Just like the text is in a label if we're in view mode and it goes into a text box if we're in edit mode. So I'm going to go and I'm going to say that I want to convert that column into a template field. All right. So now I could go in and I can say edit template. And I can pick. I could look at each individual thing. This is that command field in item mode. I could show it in edit mode and so on. Or I can go and click on column one and it shows me all the modes for that particular column. That's usually the way I, I prefer to work. Now, what I can do is I can click on that delete link and 
I can put some code in the on client click event of this. Okay? The on client click event. Now, what does the on client click event do? The on client click event, a bit of a tongue twister, all right, uh, fires off. On the client side, that is, it fires off within the browser. It doesn't fire off on the server when that link, link is clicked. All right? It's almost like an on-submit of a form, right? When you, uh, an on-submit event, when you go to submit a form, it goes in and runs some code. Well, we have the same thing here. When we click on that, we want to call some sort of function, maybe. All right? Now, we could write our own JavaScript function to handle this and call that. What I'm going to do instead is I'm simply going to throw up a confirm box that says, are you sure? And I'm actually going to put return in front of it. What does that mean? The confirm um, is, is a built-in JavaScript function that displays an OK or cancel box. It'll display your message, it'll say OK or cancel. All right? It's like an alert in JavaScript for those of you that have done JavaScript, except a JavaScript only has a, an OK or only has a close button. All right? This will have an OK or cancel. And if I click OK, it will be OK to delete. And if I click Cancel, it won't be OK to delete. So what does the return say? The return says, take the answer that the confirm gives you and give it to that on-client click event. What does that mean to give the answer to the on-client click event? Well, if that event gets sent a true, that means, yep, it's OK to delete. Go ahead and delete it. If that event gets sent a false, what that means is, no, it's not OK to delete it. All right? So, similar to what any of you that have done JavaScript and done validation in JavaScript. When you do validation in JavaScript, you call a validate function that returns a true or false. You pass that value back to the onSubmit event, right? And if it gets returned to true, it means, yep, it's OK to delete. If, or okay to continue. If it gets returned to false, that means nope, you don't want to continue, there's a problem. Same idea here. So, let's go and look at the effect of this. Go and run it. And I go and click delete. And I get an error. Well, what could the problem be? Let me Google to make sure I did everything right. Okay, it is confirming JavaScript. Pardon me? Did I not have a space after return? Yeah. Return confirm. Well, let's make it bigger. 
return confirm are you sure maybe I forgot the semicolon let's try that that is on the link button for the delete all right All right, there we go. Now if we try to delete it, then we get the error. Let me try to take out the semicolon and see if that was the error, see if maybe there was something else goofy going on. That's the only thing I changed, I know that. The other possibility is maybe I was running an old compile. Maybe I hadn't gotten out of debug mode. No, even without the semicolon it does that. So I wonder if I was still in debug mode from another session. I guess it doesn't matter. We know it works, and so that's what you do. All right, so gradually, we're, you know, step by step, we're, we're creeping into making this work a little bit better. So let's let's consider cuz cuz we had a handful of, of of objections to how it worked last time let's see how we are with them we took care of the validation now we only did one of the fields but you do the other fields the same way so i'm not going to go and do each of the fields that you need to validate okay so that's one thing second thing is the error messages we improve the error messages for Edit and, and uh, or, or update and delete. So we did that. We put the confirmation on the delete. So we did that. The only other thing I can think of, unless um, I, I forgot something, is we want a drop down for some of the fields. So that's the one we'll take care of next. The other thing, of course, that we mentioned last time, that. Um, would want to take care of is again we can go and give those columns more descriptive names instead of just being the database column again in this particular example I'm just doing a few examples of each thing uh, you would know that, that you know for a project you'd actually have to do it for you know for all of them all right so on to the drop down now again we should know that the drop down um, since that is not a normal behavior, it means that we need to convert that into a template column. So, we know that the faculty ID should be a drop down, right? Um, we know that the faculty ID should be a drop down. So, we're going to take that column and we're going, to we're going to convert it into a template field. All right. Now we can go in and we can choose to edit. Whoops. Edit templates, and we can pick the faculty ID field. All right. And we can go and we can change. This edit template right now is a text box. We don't want it to be a text box. We want it to be a drop down. All right. This is a little tricky, and I'll try to explain each step that we're going to do here. First thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the text box. That's the easy part. All right. I'm then going to go and drag a drop down list on here. Okay. Now, we obviously need a data source associated with that. So I'm going to go. And I'm going to pull over my SQL data source. All right. Then I'm going to configure it. And that, uh, do the normal things that I do. Set up the connection string. Where do I want to pull it from? I want to pull it from the faculty table. And what do I want to see in the drop down? I want to see the faculty last name and the faculty ID. Question. Do I really only want to see the faculty last name? 
No, I probably wouldn't want to see the first name and last name. I know for a while here, there were actually two Professor Blahniks. They were brothers. One taught something and one taught accounting. All right? So we wouldn't want to pick the wrong person, the wrong Blahnik. And if you consider common names like Jones or Smith or whatever, you'll see that, that you could run into difficulty. So here's what we're going to do. There isn't a column in the database for complete name. So what can we do then to get the complete name? We can actually create what's called a computed column. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and I'm going to put my own custom expression in here. And my expression is going to look like this. I'm going to write it in notepad and then I'll go and I'll paste it in here. I want to say select FL name, which is a faculty's last name, plus quote, comma, quote, plus faculty first name, plus space, plus middle initial which is I want to get the name of the field oh, that is in oh there it was that's on the desktop so, the middle initial is FMI. All right, so let's go and do that. plus FMI as full name. Does anyone know what this is called? Well, this is concatenation where we add all them together, where we, where we add string fields together where it concatenates them. And again, notice that where there's the database column is not enclosed in quotes where it's some constant. In other words, we actually want literally a comma and a space and then a space that's enclosed in quotes. What do we call this as business over here? Popular TV show a few years back, a spy show. Starring Jennifer Garner. An alias. <laughs> Very good. All right. <laughs> That's known as an alias. And you can do that with any column, but it's especially uh, valuable to do it with a computed column, right? Because there is nothing in the database called full name, all right? But we're having a computed column where we're taking and deriving a new column, or effectively a new column, from some existing columns. <clears throat> you could do, um, you could do uh, um, a computed column for any sort of thing, whether it be a date or a string or numbers. For example, if we had a baseball player, if we stored their hits and their at-bats, we could do a computed column for batting average, right? Or if we had, uh, for a car, how many miles they drove, how many gallons they used, we could do a computed column for miles per gallon. So you can do anything that you can do either string manipulation on or arithmetic or date operations, you know. Um, you could, for example, say, you know, a library book checked out today is due in, say, 28 days. You could actually take the date it was checked out and compute the, the date that it's due. All right? And that's very valuable, right? Because you wouldn't necessarily want to store the date it was checked out and the date was due, because there's always a risk of inconsistency there. All right? And if you change one, you have to change the other. So actually, that's another form of redundancy. So if you can derive fields from other fields, there's no need to store those fields. All right. I also want to pull the FID. Yes.
Right. I probably couldn't put a reserved word there. I probably couldn't put delete or select or update or something like that. But yeah, the as clues it in that that, it, that, that is a reserved word. So let me go and let me pop that line into this. Test my query. And here we go. Something weird is happening, right? Because it's showing um, all those, um, pardon me? Bunch of IDs with no names. The reason for that is some of those people have a null middle initial. And when you do any sort of operation and you include as one of the operands a null, it's like all bets are off. It doesn't treat a null like a space. So middle initial probably would be a bad idea to include in this. All right, so let's test it. There we go. There we'll see these. Now I probably would want to order this too. So I'll say order by. FL name, FF name. All right, and now we have um, our SQL data source. Now, we have to do two sorts of binding here, and it's important to understand this, right? Because there's two things that that we're interested in as far as this drop down goes. One of the things that we're interested in is where it's going to get its list of values from. In this case, it's going to get it from that data source, right? So that's one thing that we're interested in. The other thing that we're interested in is once the user selects a value from the drop down, where does it go in the original? piece of data. Where does it go in the original row? Now in this case, we our data source for this drop down, where we're getting the list of values is from the faculty table, which our query is in this data source. All right. So I'm going to go click on this and I'm going to say choose data source. That's the one thing that I have to do. And data source 2. What field do I want to display? I want to display the full name. All right. What field should the value be? Well, the value should be the ID. Uh, again, keep in mind whenever you have this, the ID is what the value of that's going to be sort of behind the scenes. That's the value that the script is going to see behind the scenes for, for that field. The text field for it, or the data field, what they call to display, the display field, I guess you'd call it, is what the user is going to see. All right, what the user is going to see. So we want the user to see something descriptive. We don't want the user to see a bunch of IDs that they, they, don't, they don't know what that is. So we show the user the full name. But what do we have to store in the database for that? We're not storing the name, we're storing the ID. So therefore, the value of that dropdown needs to be the faculty ID. This, by the way, is why multiple part keys are probably not a good idea all right, in, in database applications. Because imagine, what if the primary key, what if there was a, a goofy kind of primary key where maybe a faculty's primary key was a concatenation of the division that they belong to along with an ID number. So for example, I might be BUS1 because I'm a faculty member of the business division. And someone in nursing might be, um, um, I don't know, um, AH for allied health. They may be AH1, right? And it's a combination that makes it unique. So both divisions can have a faculty person with a number of one, but the whole primary key is a concatenation. What do you do if you have that as a case? You're absolutely right. I have no idea. All right. You, you have sort of a problem. All right. So therefore, single part keys, at least for your main tables, is the way to go because you, you get around that. All right. So that's one thing that we're interested in. We're interested in populating that 
drop down with the proper values. And now we are. But the other thing that we want to do is we want to edit data bindings to say, okay, now that we have selected the value in our drop down, what do we do with it? All right. So I'll select that. And what are we going to do with it? Normally, you can go and you can put, you can select this and select the field. Don't ask me why, but every once in a while that doesn't work. I have not seen any rhyme or reason of why that is, but sometimes that's disabled. And if I try it again Tuesday, there's a good chance it won't be disabled. So what do you do? You have to actually type in the expression. And I want to make sure I get the, the expression right, so I'm going to cheat and look on the other one. Bye. Okay, that's what I thought. So, I'm going to go then and... Edit data bindings. I'm going to bind this drop down to the FID field in the student table. No, it's the word bind, a parenthesis. FID is in quotes and then my ending parenthesis. Right, right. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I probably couldn't either, except I'm two feet away from it. Now, this is what's known as a two way binding. What does that mean? It means this. When I go into edit mode, it's going to take the FID of the student and use that to pick which element in the drop down to show. Lastly, when I go and update it, it's going to take whatever the selected value is in that drop down and put it back in the FID for that student. So it takes it uses the FID to initially set the drop down and also to then after you are going to update it to take the value from the drop down and put it back in that field. So that's two way binding. Let me summarize this. You need to do two things with the drop down. You need to say with the data source where it gets its list of values. And that will typically be another table, right? <coughs> So you'll have a data source that you created from that other table and you specify what you want to see as a data field and what you want to see as the value. The value being, of course, more than likely the primary key of that table. The other thing that we have to set is we have to set the data bindings and This is where we say where to get the value from and where to put it when we're done. So let's run this and make sure and verify that it works. We'll go and edit this guy. Notice it shows his faculty ID as Jerry, Jerry Williams. I assume that's the correct one. We can go and we can pick that person, pick a new person, Tom Blanchard. Click update. And if we look, 
It shows the faculty ID of two. And sure enough, that is Tom Blanchard. Now, the way it's now, we only see that drop down when they're in edit view. We probably want to see not the faculty ID, but we probably want to see the name when we're in display view. Uh, but we'll talk about that some other time. Here's what I want to do with the last 25 minutes of class. All right? Because we went over a lot of stuff over the last couple days. All right? I want to sort of rewind and have you practice some of this stuff. And I want you to practice it on the detail page for this. So, on the detail page, what can you do? Well, give nice error messages. Put validation for the last name. Put a drop down for faculty ID. Confirm the deletion. All right. So we have 25 minutes. I'm not sure if you'll be able to do all the things, but do pretty much the same thing I did on the grid view. Do it on the details view. All right. This will leave off inserting, and we'll talk about inserting. This will lead off inserting and a few other topics, and we'll, we'll hit those next week. All right. So let's get up the lab. I would, again, um, like you to go at least until uh, 6.30 on this, so you have 20, 25 minutes. And... Um, at 6.30, you can either continue to work on this, uh, or if you want to work on your lab, you're welcome to. I will zip up this guy and, and make sure it's uploaded so that you have a good starting point.